Good morning. Welcome to the first Business World Insights series for 2021 on leading in uncertain times. What lessons have businesses learned close to a year into the pandemic? Today, three business leaders will share their insights as we beat our own paths through this crisis. Our first speaker is attorney Emmanuel Bonon, vice chairman and chief operating officer of professional services firm KPMG Philippines, where he also heads advisory services. Before joining KPMG in 2007, Mr. Bonoan was finance undersecretary under three department secretaries with oversight for programs that cracked down on corrupt tax officials and ran after tax evaders till 2005. He has a Master of Laws degree from the University of Warwick and a Juris Doctor degree from the, Aten At from the Ateneo de Manila University. Good morning, attorney. Hello, good morning. Would you have an opening statement? Yes, okay, thank you. Well, good morning first to the editors and organizers of this Business World Forum, and good morning to your online audience. Um, as we approach the first year of the pandemic and the resultant community quarantines in the Philippines, I think it's a fair assessment that management skills of corporate leaders have been tested in extreme ways. Those leaders whose organizations will come out of this situation relatively unscathed, unscathed and even those that survive this pandemic will be able to claim bragging rights about how they steered their corporate ships amidst the storm. By now, many leaders have implemented crisis management strategies. They have kept a close eye on cash flows, tightened expenditures, negotiated with suppliers and their customers. All of these are the right responses to what's rightly been described ad nauseum as an unprecedented situation. However, more than testing our management skills, this pandemic has presented a direct challenge to corporate leaders' sense of ethics and morality. Why is this so? A lot of the choices that we had to make at the inception of the lockdowns, and even till now, boils down to economics, and the bottom line on one hand, uh, versus the well-being of individual lives, that is the welfare of our people, on the other hand. For instance, after we've implemented cost-cutting measures such as renegotiating with our suppliers, questions still arise such as, do we let go of our employees so that we can preserve cash flow? And never even mind the bottom line. Never mind even the bottom line. Or another question is that, do we maintain our full complement of employees so that we can still service our clientele while ensuring that we do not go into the red? If so, how do we do this? An even worse question is, if we are to cut employees, whom shall we cut? I'm sure that leaders have been faced with these questions before, but certainly not on the scale the consistency and the intensity that COVID has presented them. Even now, for instance, we face the moral imperative of providing vaccines to our employees. These vaccines aren't cheap, and by doing so, we add another layer of cost to our, employee, to our operations. How do we resolve a question such as, do we provide vaccines free of charge to our employees? In these times more than ever, a leader has to rely on a moral and ethical framework. This framework should have been developed not in this time of crisis, but during quote unquote, ordinary times. I truly believe that times of crisis don't change you, but show the true you. So what are the building blocks of this framework? One, and these are my building blocks. One, a personal outlook formed by your experiences and upbringing. Hopefully by now you've had the time and experience, experience to develop your own moral compass and know where your moral and ethical safe harbors are. Second, culture. We Filipinos understand that the group, 
rather than the self is more important. Thus, taking care of one's own is ingrained in many of us. On another level and very important is company culture. If the leaders of the company have committed themselves to the welfare of their employees, then their actions in the time of COVID will most likely be guided by the philosophy that they have set for themselves. Third, a discernment of purpose. An organization whose leaders understand its purpose will be able to make their decisions and strategic actions that ensure its purpose will be achieved. Of course, this has more moral and ethical consequences too, such as, is the purpose of an, organ of an organization only to make money for its shareholders, or is its purpose more inclusive and gives importance to a wider set of stakeholders, such as the public, clients, employees, and shareholders? In an international uh, survey conducted by KPMG among CEOs, 70% of respondents said that they felt a stronger emotional connection to their corporate purposes than before the pandemic. Long after this pandemic is over, corporate leaders' actions will be, remain, will be remembered by the organization's stakeholders. How leaders responded will be judged not just by this generation, but even possibly future generations. Trust will be a huge factor in this new reality and will define how others view the organization. Will you, as a leader, be trusted to protect your employees' health, safety, and well-being, at the same time delivering profits to your shareholders? Or will you be seen as being insensitive and caring? I'll stop here and not make any specific prescription of how company leaders should behave. I've seen organizations perform quite well using these building blocks of ethical and moral decision-making in arriving at management actions. On the other hand, I've seen at least one organization's leaders perform poorly, and I'm not talking about mine. In closing, I go back to my original statement that this crisis presents not only strategic management challenges, but also moral and ethical challenges. A true leader is one who is able to recognize when these challenges arise and respond to them in a way that benefits not just the organization, but all those who have a stake in it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, rather comprehensive uh, strategic overview on crisis uh, response attorney. Next, we have Mr. Kenneth Yang, President President and Chief Executive Officer of Golden Arches Development Corporation, the master franchise holder of McDonald's in the Philippines. In 2006, he took over McDonald's Philippines, which came to the country in 1981. He has an MBA from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor of Science degree in Management Engineering from the Ateneo. Good morning, Kenneth. Good morning. Good morning, Willie, and to the audience here at uh, the Business World Forum. Uh, happy to be here to also share the stage with uh, our fellow panelists, Attorney Noel and uh, Stephen, my good friend. Uh, anyway, I, let me start by saying I won't really dwell much on how the pandemic has impacted our business, but rather I will share with you the things we did as a company and as a brand, uh, and also how we plan to move forward. So last year in early March, we have we developed a business continuity plan. And that plan consisted of uh, four stages. First stage was response, or how we responded to the crisis. And this was really, uh, in particular, the first few months of the quarantine from March to April. And uh, the response was done in consideration of developments in both national and local government guidelines. Uh, the second part of our framework was recovery. And this is the period of the second half of last year. Uh, this was a time when uh, the 
government allowed uh, businesses to open up more and dine-in was allowed at 30% capacity. Some of our plans around recovery were also implemented during the quarantine to protect the brand and the business. The third stage was rebound. And this is the period when we see demand increase and sales improve. And that is actually, I think, this year. And renewal is, is the fourth phase, which is the time when we expect normalcy to come back. And although it might be completely different from what normal was before. And we think it takes place next year. So in 2020, we responded to the pandemic by firstly prioritizing people. And uh, the primary need was the safety of our people through our MSAFE program. MSAFE is founded on our belief that if we keep our people safe, our customers will also be safe. And so for our frontliners, which mean our crew and managers, aside from providing them the equipment that they need, we also ensured the safety of their workplace. And we also partnered with the government for our frontliners to get tested, swabbed and tested with the gold standard RT-PCR method. We also enhanced our existing health and safety protocols and was the first to implement the no touch delivery and drive through policy. And we also dedicated a safety manager to make sure all the health and safety protocols were upheld. Recovering revenue caused by mass, uh, by quarantine restrictions like dine-in capacity, mass gatherings, age restrictions and curfew, we focused on our delivery and drive through channels improving accessibility and overall customer experience. For delivery, we activated cashless payment, opened more hubs with Food Panda, with third party uh, operators like them, and we added other ordering channels. We also activated and supported drive through we worked on optimizing our service times to address the growing demand. So despite the overperformance of our delivery and drive through channels, we remain challenged to find other sources of revenue. And we launched other innovations like park order and pay for the restaurants without drive through Another innovation that responded to the need of our people to share moments together during online gatherings like meetings, conventions, parties. Through, through a program we call Send to Many, customers can now order online and have food delivered to multiple locations at the same time. Of course, uh, another important initiative we did was through our charity was, was through helping our communities through our charity of choice, which was, which is Ronald McDonald House Charities. And we call the program the McDonald's Kindness Kitchens. So at the height of the lockdown and even up to today, McDonald's Kindness Kitchens provides meals to those who in need, to the frontliners and volunteers. And as of today, we're happy to share that we have served over 400,000 pot meals to those in need. So as we plan to rebound this year, there are four strategic areas we are focusing on. First is recovering revenue. The second is rebuilding operations. Third is rethinking the organization. And then last, accelerating the adoption of digital solutions. Of course, we will also con continue our commitment to people from the safety and well-being of our employees, and more importantly, our customers, and also to the community that need us the most. Thank you, and looking forward to feedback and your questions.
thank you, Kenneth, for that uh, brief on uh, McDonald's uh, response to the pandemic and the crisis it uh, brought us. I'm particularly uh, interested on that point on rethinking the organization, but probably we'll just go to that later. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Stephen Tan, president of Shopping Center Management Corporation, better known as SM Supermalls. He took over the company in, in late January last year after a stint as COO in the, in the same SM unit. So this crisis is something of a baptism of fire for him. Uh, Mr. Tan led the launch of several SM Prime malls like SM Mall of Asia in Pasay City in 2006 and SM Aura Premier in Taguig in 2013. He joined SM in 2004. Uh, taking charge of mall operations at the podium. Uh, he completed an MBA at the Paris Graduate School of Management and has a degree in business management from UST. You have the floor now, Stephen. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Tan. I'm the president of SM Super Malls. 2020 has been a difficult year for everyone, most especially for the retail industry and the country at large. We were on lockdown for many months, starting by on, on March 16 until March 17 until May 16. Although malls now are open again, consumer confidence is not yet 100% back to normal. Spending is muted. We are hoping that 2021 would be a better year for everyone, a year of recovery for all our stakeholders, our employees, our tenants, and of course, our customers. We are missing our core market, families, children, and senior, and we wish that they will come back again soon to shop and dine at SM Super Malls. As you know, SM has a very wide footprint of malls across the country, from Luzon, all the way down to Mindanao. And we affect so many lives, so many employments. And we know from our experience in 2020, in order to recover, this has to be a collaborative effort to rise above this adversity. I'm happy to share my experience from how we cope and how we rebuild the, the, our company better for 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, let's now proceed to some questions. Um, maybe everyone can be on the screen. Yes. Uh, first, let's go to you, uh, Stephen. Uh, economic managers and economists uh, expect the overall economy to bounce back to 2019 levels in the middle of next year. Uh, outlooking your business. Okay, um, you know, 2020, I mean, we all know that, you know, it's a very challenging year for everyone. Uh, 2020 really was all about surviving. It's That's all we everyone's doing to be able to survive and not to lose out on business. No? But 2021, we feel this year is a year of recovery. Of course, the first half of the year would still be, you know, um, will, will still slowly grow, but we are confident by the second half of the year, especially when the vaccine comes out, it will slowly go back to normal. We expect that everything will be back to 2019 level on the last, quar last quarter of the year. Um, BPI is looking at relaxing uh, age restrictions for lowers to uh, to 10 years old, uh, you think it's uh, fast enough for your plan? Yeah, I, I, that would help a lot. No, We have been in conversation with uh, DTI closely, and uh, we've worked with Secretary Lopez very closely also. Um, uh, of course, the, because a lot of our uh, customers are really the teens. No? A lot of them, you know, they come to our malls, and we really need them. The, from, from the, I bring it down to at least around 10 years old, because in the news today, yeah. 
Um, going to your plans, uh, SM uh, opened to most in Mindanao in November last year. But before the pandemic, I think the plan was to open uh, 17 new malls between 2020 and 2022. So four for last year, six for this year, seven in 2022. How has the plan changed? Okay. Of course, because of the restrictions of uh, construction and not just for our own construction, but construction of our tenants as well. No, uh, It has slowed down, but we are business as usual and uh, the plan has not changed for the five year. We have adjusted our timetable, but for the five year business plan, it still remains the same. Okay, so now let's go to this topic. Uh, what kind of assistance is being at, uh, extended to tenants right now? Because I recall that there was a two month uh, rent retrieve uh, between March and May last year. Yes, we were, we, well, we were closed from March 17 until May 16. Now, the only ones that are open are were uh, the supermarket and the pharmacy and the banks. No? So, even the restaurants, the likes of McDonald's and, and, and the bench group and all the retail, the, the retail was uh, closed during that time. So we did not charge rent at all. There is that, that zero rent. But after that, no, uh, we assist them then as well. Until now, we're still assisting them. No, um, For the large part of uh, 2020, from the time that we opened, we were only getting the percentage rent. From whatever so whatever they sell they per set certain very low uh, percentage rent that's all we did this is to be able for them to survive to be able for them not to close their business so we really feel that you know uh working together with our tenants or our merchants you know, is really key to be able to help a lot of things you know, a lot the businesses the msmes but even to the employees of our tenants well, when you go to malls now, I think something that one thing that strikes uh, you is that cinema areas are cordoned off. So could you share with us what are the plans for cinema cinema spaces? Okay, uh, cinemas are still not yet allowed in Metro Manila. No, the IATF issued a, a memorandum saying that um, cinemas or all the entertainment. Um, the uh, sector uh, has not, it's not yet allowed to open during uh, GCQ. No, they will be allowed to open hopefully when we transition into MGCQ. So, um, but but our provincial, if you go to our provincial areas, the likes of Pampanga, Cavite, or Bulacan, uh, our cinemas there are are already operational. But of course. Um, you know, because of all of the offerings on 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 the blockbuster, Wonder Woman was supposed to be shown late last year, which was moved several times and eventually went to HBO. No, so we're still waiting for that uh, approval from IATF to come out so that we could go back to business again. We feel that um, the format will change eventually. We have done a. A, a roadmap into pivoting our business, making smaller venues and um, and um, for for theater rentals, not just for to, for watching, but also for TED talks and and the likes, no. So uh, or esports gaming, all these things, no. But um, this will happen, of course, once we transition back to. It. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, going to you, Kenneth. Uh, same question on um, that point of economists uh, expecting a rebound to 2019 levels for the economy only by the middle of next year. Do you share that outlook for your own business? Yeah. Um, yes, actually, for our business, uh, which was one of the most uh, impacted business, uh, sectors last year and and it continues this year no the restrictions and lockdowns as well as the uh, i guess aid restrictions uh, prevention of mass gathering all these things are still a hindrance to recovering the, the whole uh, potential of the business so I think this year it will be in an improvement over last year for us, but we will not yet be there. Uh, I think 
with the emergence of the vaccines, it will become uh, uh, helpful, and especially it will add to consumer confidence also to go out because at this time, uh, consumer confidence, although improved, is still uh, quite low, I think. Uh, and so that's why um, you don't see uh, restaurants and especially in the dine-in component of restaurants, it's it's still weak. Uh, however, uh, other channels have offset some of that. Uh, and when I say channels, I mean, uh, for example, in our business, it's the drive-through and also delivery. So those other means of uh, consumption by our customer are is what is excelling or increasing right now. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Uh, Attorney Bonon, let's go to KPMG. Uh, may we know what areas of your company's work were particularly affected by the crisis and uh, how did the uh, management address those challenges? Well, um, as you know, we're, we're a professional services firm. We, we, we do audits, we do consulting, tax consultancy, business advisory. Um, um fortunately for the audit um it was very stable i think what um how we were able to cope to cope with this um i would say operationally it also became challenging for us because the what we call the busy season or the tax season was extended Thank from you. um all the way to may i think may or june so this um this uh put pressure on us to do more work even during this extended period. But um, we were very prepared for it because we had for a long time been making investments in technology, digital technology. So um, from day one, we were able to transition work, all 1,000 plus of our people, I think 1,500 people to work digitally from their homes, safely from their homes. So, um, so uh, we also came up with new technology tools for, for our clients to be able to coordinate well with us. Uh, collaboration sites were, became the norm, whereas before we would have to, we would have to convince clients to use colla digital collaboration sites. Um, one area that picked up uh, of the business were, was our digital, is our digital advisory services. And um, this is not surprising, cybersecurity has become an issue um, and therefore, our cybersecurity uh, practice um, has been kept very busy. Digital transformation has been uh, has been now picked up tremendously, and I'm very proud to say that we're one of the few firms that offer services like robotic process automation, whereby uh, processes, manual processes that can take, say, for example, 14 hours. Um, after we implement robotic process automation can take all of four minutes. So you can see that because of this, um, uh, we've become even more efficient. Uh, and I think um, that that will be the norm going forward. So I think if this hadn't happened, maybe it would, maybe it would, would have um, slowed our digital transformation uh, down, but, but no, this has, uh, digital transformation has uh, been the norm of our firm, especially, and so especially since we offer that to our clients. And thank you, attorney. That's very interesting. Uh, you're um, going headlong into uh, the digital space. How about uh, for Stephen and Kenneth? What's your experience here? Uh, can you give us an idea of how much uh, online business now contributes to your uh, to your whole business? Uh, probably, let's go to Stephen. What's your experience? Okay. Uh um, of course, that also um, accelerated our digital transformation. No? Uh, we launched our online uh, SMOs online last uh, late last year, November was the first. The first mall that went online was uh, Mega Mall, and then eventually Mall of Asia and North Edsa joined. But aside from that, we did a lot of innovation uh, in terms of like the likes of uh, curbside pickup, call to deliver. These are all, um, you know, part of all the transformation and pivoting that we have been doing. No, um, you can now call a number and ask them. You know, Filipinos are very they like interaction still we, we really feel that way and for those people who 
street cannot come to the mall. They we gave a number that is easy to remember so that they could call that number and and, and somebody would assist them. That's like the, our personal shopper assistance, no? So they could call that number and if ever that 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 product is not on on stock, so they could you know recommend other products. So these are all in the innovations that we have done in the in the past year, no? Um, but still, we feel that you know cost, since customers are still are, are slowly coming back to our, our malls. We are now at around 50 to 60 percent uh, pre-COVID level. It, we, we started very low. Last May, when we reopened, we were only around uh, 18 percent of the traffic. But right now, our footfall has increased up to around 60 percent already. No? Uh, the take up on, on, on online is still very low. So, it's not just e-commerce. Uh, digital transformation is not just about e-commerce. It's also about uh, innovation on what can you offer. If they really cannot come to our malls, give them options, delivery, uh, personal shopper, curbside pickup, and all this, all, all this cashless transaction. These are all something that we are focusing on right now. So would you say that uh, all these digital initiatives are not just uh, momentary responses to the crisis, but these are things that will continue uh, going into the next years. Definitely, definitely. We have actually created a, a, a team to focus just on digital transformation. No? So uh, it's, it's about making it easy for customers and omnichannel is really the answer of the future. Uh, you can choose to either browse online and shop you know, offline or browse offline and shop online so it's 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 not either or it you have to work together that's that's really the future of retail oh, that's interesting uh kenneth what's your experience in digitizing operations and services uh well i think it's been invaluable no? uh, and uh critical to our survival as a company and as a brand so we're lucky that I think uh, we embarked on our digital transformation uh, early, early on, even prior to the pandemic. Although, uh, like most companies, our plan of uh, digital transformation, what was you know planned for five years, I think, was accelerated all into 2020. So with respect to our internal operations, uh, I think that's like uh, KPMG and, and SM. Uh, we were forced, of course, to ensure that we're all connected and that we could work from home. Uh, and that's been uh, very, very important uh, to our being able to communicate and uh, work, continue to work uh even though we are far apart uh the other more important uh more important aspect is with respect to our revenue uh and uh, as people were not able to come to the restaurants then we had to make sure that we were accessible to them and we would uh they would be able to still get our our products uh, through delivery and um, delivering used to be uh, a smaller part of the business because there was dine-in dine uh, and there were other channels. Uh, but definitely it has accelerated, uh, increased significantly last year uh, and will continue to do so. I think uh, uh, it's really a permanent change. And of course, these are enabled through the di digital uh, online. So. We have our McDonald's uh, McDelivery app. Uh, we have, we're available through the website. And we have partnered with third party operators also, like uh, Grab and Food Panda. And even also with uh, our uh, landlords, like SM, which uh, Stephen mentioned earlier. So uh, in, in, in SM, they've enabled their tenants to also take advantage of uh, their own digital uh, services. So we're also part of that. And uh, I think it's critical 
that the company, especially for us who are um, in retail, to be able to do that for our customers. Uh, and like uh, Stephen said, it's all about making it easy and convenient to the customer, uh, wherever they are. So are actually it's anytime, anywhere. Okay. Well, very early on in the pandemic, Kenneth, uh, starting just a day or a few days after the first lockdown, I noticed that we took two videos to assure the public of uh, McDonald's health protocols. Uh, you gave the impression that it was important to reach out immediately and promptly to the public. Can you just tell us how you came to that decision to reach out fast through the internet? Well, uh, obviously, this is very unprecedented precedented and uh, a really huge uh, event. And I think for uh, the consumers and our customers, it was very important and critical that they be assured uh, and that we're focused on their safety. Uh, and we did it by uh, really having this playbook ready um, we call it a unsafe program for us. And actually, that was not developed uh, on March 16 or 7 uh, when we launched it, no? March, uh, the first week, no. It, we were actually prepared in the sense that we've heard the news already from uh, China and globally during like December, January. And so we anticipated that and... Uh, prepared for that. The video is just one small thing uh, because behind that video was a whole set of operational procedures uh, which we continue to update today. So that is like a manual for all of our uh, restaurant employees and our franchisees uh, to follow, uh, assuring the safety of our people and assuring the safety of our customers. So that's very interesting that uh, uh, even before the uh, lockdown was announced, you're already uh, preparing for the worst case scenario when you heard of the virus going, uh, uh, well, worsening in China and going out of China's borders. Uh, my next question for everyone, actually, uh, uh, what have you learned about making decisions and planning amid the crisis? But for some big companies, for instance, the crisis has shortened their planning cycles from annual to semi-annual to quarterly. Uh, attorney, uh, what has changed in uh, decision-making and planning in KPMG? Well, um, one of the planning tools that we use, uh, that, that has changed. Or it hasn't changed, but we use it more intensely now. So taking shorter timelines of our cash flows, for instance, which I oversee, is very important. Um, we now review cash flows on, on a daily basis, not just, you know, more frequently. We, we, have, um, we have consultations based on what our cash flows look like, because at this, at this time, cash flows is even more important than ever. I mean, you've heard, uh, you've heard uh, the, the phrase cash is king, and more so now. Um, that's one. Next is... Um, the ability to listen carefully to all parts of the organization. And we do this uh, through, we still have our ongoing crisis management committee meetings where all the parts of the organization are represented. And we look at issues as they come up. No? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that anything new has happened, but I think the scale, the intensity with which we're doing it, and the um, how how we're doing it, we're more innovative in how we do it. So um, we've always tried to adhere to international best practice, and now more than ever is the time to you know to practice to practice what we preach to our clients. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Attorney uh, Stephen. Same question. Okay, um, you know, this pandemic, nobody knew that it's going to happen and nobody has that playbook. So you really have to be very agile. As a leader, you have to know agility is key. You have to be fast. You have to be responsive. 
there since there's no playbook you know forget about the past move on move forward so that you could really address the situation another thing just like what uh um, attorney have said no transparency is key and communication is really key we have our you know a monthly town hall meeting with our employees where they could you know um address their questions and 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 also to 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 appease their fears so there's a lot of fear that's happening or that's ongoing during the uh, during the pandemic no even me myself i fear because tao lang naman ako. we're only human no so you know communication is really key be very transparent and be very open about and listen to them so those are the two things that i really feel that is very important agility responsiveness and of course transparency and kenneth for uh mcdonald philippines uh, how has uh, planning and planning and decision making changed amid the crisis well it's very similar to and uh, i agree with what uh Stephen and what attorney noel said no? uh and i i think it's at this time when things are very fluid you really have to have uh the ability to anticipate or maybe plan for multiple scenarios uh you need to have consultation with all the stakeholders including government because that's where uh the policy come in um uh, I agree, time is of the essence. So fast, agile decisions are important. And it needs to be communicated clearly across the organization and all the stakeholders so that when it's time to execute, uh, and execution is, is only assured when you have uh, like thorough alignment in the whole organization so that's that's really how um we were able to kind of cope cope with this crisis and we we think that's how we have to operate moving forward uh i just have to uh, slot this in from the uh, audience uh, so there's a question i'm curious what's a typical day for uh, steven kenneth and attorney pre-pandemic and during the pandemic what leadership skills routine can you share with us Stephen. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, leadership skills, no, I think as I just like what I mentioned, you have to have the ability to adapt and to adapt fast. There, you know, um, we we have in in SM we have done a lot of pivoting of our business. Just like for example, no, you know, you could never even think of you know having to buy chicken nuggets that's frozen. Of, of mcdonald's but right now it's now available uh in in our sm supermarket right uh Tim Tai Fung, Xiao Lung Pao, they were they were fast they were they were very fast to be able to adapt to changes no before you wanted your Xiao Lung Pao, which is the dumpling to be eaten piping hot but now you can buy it frozen also in the supermarket so there's a lot of this um pivoting and that you should be able to to, to cascade and to be able to operate. No? Another thing that I feel that you have to have the perseverance and uh, to be able to think out of the box. You, you have to be able to do that because, as I've said, there's really no playbook and nobody knew that this is going to happen. So um, we also put um, safety into a top of mind talaga, no? so whenever that a customer comes into our mall they feel safe they feel that the air is clean and then we have this disinfected so you you have to be able to communicate not just to your employees but also to your customer uh kenneth what has changed for you amid the pandemic and what uh, skills do you consider uh, vital for your dad well, before the pandemic, my routine was uh, was really, you know, about going to the office and, and really uh, meeting with our team and then visiting the restaurants, I think. And communication was an important part of that routine. I think that, that really hasn't uh, changed now that it's the pandemic. I, I think communication continues to be an important uh, routine for me. Uh, although maybe it's not uh there there were some hindrances to being physically present but uh 
you know, the virtual uh, meetings and virtual uh, uh, visits are, are, have now replaced that. Although I think lately uh, it's been my routine now to again visit the restaurants because I guess it doesn't really, it enhances uh, the physical uh, you know, relationship also. Uh, and communication. So, of course, with the proper safeguards. And uh, I think reassuring your people and reassuring your customers uh, continues to be key. So, for me, uh, the routine is still there, uh, not changed much except for the, the physical aspect. Um, attorney, what has changed for you? What's your day like? But I. I think my days become more intense. Um, you know, everything from managing the firm itself, as well as um, interacting with clients, as well as um, making sure we deliver um, engagements up to quality, you know, uh, as expected. And also even looking for new clients, you know, it's become more intense. And I agree with what Stephen and uh, Kenneth have said about um, agility, about, um, That's it. I'm speaking. about listening to, um, to to stakeholders. And on top of all this, I would like to go back to my original opening statement about a heightened uh, sense of ethics and morality, because this pandemic um, will keep uh, throwing situations at us where we will be forced to make moral and ethical decisions. And that I think is something that every leader should have, you know, a moral and, uh, framework for decision-making, um, not just technical decision-making, but also ethical uh, decision-making and knowing one safe harbor, moral safe harbor and moral compass. So that one, that is uh, long playing. I don't see this I don't see, see this pandemic going away soon, even if you have vaccines. Issues, health issues will keep cropping up as the, vac as the virus mutates. So these same moral uh, dilemmas and ethical dilemmas, we will, as leaders, always be, um, always be faced with. So we have to have that heightened sense of um, knowing how to address them. Well, let me... Let me ask you this, who's your role, role model for leading through a crisis and uh, which of his or her traits do you particularly admire? That's a, that's a difficult question. Um, there are so many, you know, there are so many leaders uh, who, who have exhibited uh, crisis management traits, whether they're politicians or business leaders. But I think a lot of us, even on this call, have already gone through a crisis that's so, as, it, as Kenneth has called it, and as it's known, unprecedented that we've had to deliver, we've had to develop our own leadership styles and our own responses um, to this pandemic. Uh, Stephen pointed out that there is no playbook. And yes, that's he's, he's correct. We are writing the playbook. So in a sense, um, we, 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 we learn from example, from our own experiences. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kenneth, would you have a model to share with us? Actually, um, very hard to answer a question. I really don't have one particular uh, model, but in my experience, what's happened is that everyone in the organization, let's say in, in McDonald's, in our organization, um they everyone's really stepped up because uh i think that the crisis brings out the best in everyone and what i've seen is that you know even uh especially for our people in the restaurants um attorney noel spoke about uh moral ethical uh the aspect and that was also something we had to deal with, you know, when most everyone was being asked to stay at home, we had to continue to operate our restaurants. And our crew and managers, who we call our frontliners, our heroes, they actually stepped up 
and they uh, through of course personal sacrifice and risk uh, continue to uh, manage and operate the restaurants for the benefit of our customers in the communities uh, where our restaurants are and so I, I would say um, there are many many traits that uh, I've seen for the, the different people in our organization, even our franchisees as well, who've um, you know, demonstrated, and I, I really admire them for, for doing that. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Um, Steven, you, you have know, any other model? If there would be one that would be Tatang, that would be Henry C. Senior, no? You know, after World War II, you know, um, he he was selling shoes immediately, and with 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 an idea of he could if he could sell shoes to every Filipino people, he would be rich. That that's really focus and that's determination. Don't forget that we also built our 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 first mall, 1985-86, Ethan City North Elsa during the people power crisis that was that was one of the worst uh, economic crisis in the philippines and, and you know 97 we were you know during the crash of the asian during the asian crisis we were building and opening five malls each year so for me just stay focused make sure that you know um you, you help out your employees to take care of your employees your your tenants and also the community you would definitely go through this and and you would recover from this uh, thank you uh question from the audience uh, well you know i mean amid the pandemic what has come to the force the value of uh, uh human talent uh question could you give us a few tips on motivating your workforce through these tough through these tough times attorney perhaps we could do to, uh, to you you know, we always go back to our purpose. You know? And maybe nowadays that sounds like an empty, it sounds empty, but no, it's not because every organization has to have a purpose. And for us, it's a commitment to our clients, it's a commitment to our people and a commitment to our communities. So that is our purpose. And we've seen that um, when you know that purpose, when you're aware of that purpose, when you live it out, then um, your employees are, are believe in you and are motivated because of that one. Of course, there, there's so many other techniques to motive, to keep your employees motivated. Um, it's a combination of compensation, of benefits, of all these extracurricular activities, which we all do. But at the end of the day, it's really knowing your the organization's purpose and living it out. And um, that itself motivates uh, your employees to make do, to do their best. Thank you, attorney. Uh, Kenneth, how do you motivate the uh, McDonald's employees? Well, uh, aside from what uh, attorney Noel said, which is, I, I agree completely. You know, as I said, um, sometimes in, in these times of crisis, people, uh, the motivation is actually self-motivation. Uh, and I've seen that with our own people, that they knew, they knew, or and they felt that uh, they needed to step up to ensure the survival of the brand and the company. Uh, and so, I think what's important is to ensure that communication is there, um, reassurance, and so that's uh, one of the things we did and continue to do that we have continuous communication with them, telling them the truth, being transparent about what's happening, uh, what we need to do. Uh, and if that is very clear to them, they will actually step up and they are self-motivated to do uh, the things that they need to do. In fact, for our people, they realize uh, the, the gravity of the situation that they are, uh, we also did personal sacrifices, so we've we've had um, to make some sacrifices as well in in our company's uh, BNP, for example, 
and 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 uh, despite that the motivation is very high uh, and they know they need to do this for us to survive and then later thrive as a company and i think uh, the goodwill that the company has uh, created with our employees uh, for so many years they know and trust that the company if they take care of the company that the company will take care of them and vice versa thank you kenneth and uh, stephen what's uh, what's sm uh, doing uh, to motivate its employees you know um very much similar to uh, kpmg and mcdonald's no for us we, you really take good care of your employees during bad times uh we did not do any pay cuts uh we even give out is our usual 13th month and our 14th month pay no um you know if you do that if you make sure that you communicate well with your with your employees and your executives no? uh, they will really take care of the business the culture of malasakit in in the sm is very much alive no? that's why we also have programs such as volunteerism you know we do outreach programs we can really see and feel the bayanihan spirit of helping each other no that in turn if they see that you are helping a lot of people they will really make sure that they also protect the business thank you Stephen. probably as a final uh question okay so uh all of us are now on recovery mode so what now um Attorney, can you? I, I know you touched on this in your introductory remarks, but uh, can you just take us to a checklist on what business planners who are now worried about how to move forward? Uh, what should they consider when planning for a rebound? What questions should he or she ask? Yes, that's, uh, that's a good question. There are a lot of questions, but what I would point out, aside from what I said about um, being prepared to answer difficult moral and ethical issues. One, and uh, Stephen touched on this, was agility. The ability to plan around shorter time frames, uh, the ability to keep closer watch on um, cash flows is important. But at the same time, the ability to not to scrimp on quality. That's what we keep emphasizing to our people. We are a professional services firm. Our clients are very demanding. Um, our clients are with the top 1,000 corporations, whether domestic or uh, multinationals, very demanding. And um, just for example, because we've negotiated fees with, they've negotiated fees with us, doesn't mean that we deliver half-baked work. No? In fact, now is the time to show our commitment to our clients that we're going the extra mile for them. Um, so that's that's another one. Another one is, and we've talked about this, is um, how do you ensure that your people? Um, how do you ensure that your people are up to speed and are motivated? Well, uh, there are a number of ways to do that. Communication has been has been a key uh, discussion point here. Training of our people. We are again, we're a professional service firm. Our people have to learn new things and have to get better at the things they're doing. So we have we we make you have to make um, investments in training, continuous training, because well, this might last a long time, all this, this situation will pass. No? And um, if you come out on top of it, you have to come out to, on top of it being better than you were than when you entered into it. No? Um, so those are just some of the things at the top of my mind. Um, a lot of things I, I, I do want to say, but time constraints obviously are here, but those are just some of the things at the top of my mind I can share with. Thank you, attorney. Uh, Stephen, uh, probably with the exception of groceries and drugstores, uh, brick and mortar retailers have been among the hardest hit during the lockdown. What are the key areas that retailers should be focusing on at this time that they are planning a rebound? Okay. You know, you have to be able to see and understand your business very well. Um, you know, what was essential before? may not hold through what is essential now so you have to make sure that your business that you are an essential so a lot of people talking about talk about essentials no but do you really know what essential for you what do you know what is essential for your customers are you still an essential or are you just a surplus so you just have you really have to know you have to know you have to be able to answer that Another thing is 
use technology. Use technology to be able to help you. Use data to be able to help you understand how you move forward. So those are, I think, uh, key things that the retailers should really look into no? when, when going back so that they could bounce back better and stronger. Learn from this pandemic. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And Kenneth, what areas should uh, companies in your sector prioritize now as they try to get back on track? Well, uh, similar, you know, uh, to what uh, Stephen said, we're we're also in that uh, sector, like a, a brick and mortar uh, type sector. I think one important thing that uh, will allow, you know, our industry to survive is adaptability, uh, and really being keenly aware of what uh, our customers' mindsets and uh, their behaviors are or how they have changed. And so we have to also modify our businesses, our, our, our operations, our channels uh, to satisfy their new expectation. So for example, if uh, safety is their uh, topmost priority, then you have to have uh, safety solutions so that uh, your visits to your restaurant or uh, consumption of your products are uh, reassured with that aspect. So I think um, digital, obviously, digital is uh, not just for our industry, but I think for all industries and all businesses is critical now. Uh, it enables uh, speed, efficiency, also convenience, access to to the customer. So I think uh, definitely that I think is a permanent change uh, moving forward. And so we have to be able to harness uh, the potential uh, that it gives. Okay, uh, let's just... Uh go to the closing uh, closing remarks uh, to end this uh, session. Attorney, perhaps we can start with you. Well, I think a lot of great ideas were already thrown around, so I, I guess I, I really can't add anything more, but um, just to go back to, to what I said at the beginning, you know, that uh, corporate leaders um, will be challenged in so many ways and none more so than in making sure that not only organization, not only the organization survives, but also um, its people, the welfare of its people, um, that uh, the public is taken care of, stakeholders such as shareholders as well are taken care of, and this entails a, a very difficult balancing of choices. Um, in that, you'll have to only fall back on you can have all the technical knowledge you you have, um, you can have access to all the digital tools, but at the end of the day. Um, it's the ability to make the right decisions and relying on a set of ethical and moral principles that are well grounded in not only in, uh, in theory but also in practice. Thank you, Attorney. Kenneth, may we have your closing statement? Yeah. Well, according to our chairman and founder, Dr. George T. Yang, um, crisis brings out the best in people and organizations. And opportunities are there. Um, crisis creates opportunities and that the opportunities can be seized. Uh, actually, we've seen silver linings uh, in, in our experience. You know, for example, the crisis has forced us to be more efficient uh, our people, our processes, our systems, uh, enabling us to operate uh, and, and even lower our break-evens. And so um, hopefully we are able to retain what we've learned uh, during this crisis and take them when the, when the time uh, improves. And when that happens, then you can be an even uh, better and improved organization going forward. So in, in, for us uh, in the food industry, 
uh, like we said earlier also, I think the, the, the key things for us, it's really uh, keeping abreast of what the consumers uh, are thinking and what they want. And I think right now uh, for us, work needs to be done and continues to be done on uh, prioritizing safety and prioritizing digital. Uh, I think, and you know, very hopeful for the future. This is just a temporary setback, uh, we believe, and that we will be on the road to renewal uh, in just a few months time. So thank you again for this opportunity. I learned a lot uh, from our panelists, Stephen and attorney Noel. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. Thank you, Kenneth uh, and Stephen. Are, Stephen, are there any words you'd like to leave with us? Of course, um, you know, Mr. Reyes, uh, we, look, we look at the experience of our China malls for inspiration on how we plan to move forward from where we are now to a post-pandemic scenario here in the Philippines. In China, everything is now back to normal and there is a surge of revenge spending as well as family events inside the malls. This is because they have innovated use technology to rebuild better and become omnichannel very early. A brand has to be shoppable and shippable. We will work with our tenant partners such as McDonald's, with research companies and look forward on our strength in dealing with the crisis to recover quickly for the stake of all our customers employees, partners, and shareholders. For those who are leaders of organization, what is important is a listening ear, quick responses, and empathy towards those we impact. Help your tenant and work with your tenant partners. Work with your employees and help the community. Anyway, we are all interconnected. Thank you for inviting me this morning. And, and just like Kenneth, I learned a lot from our co-panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Well, we've come to the end of uh, this session of the first series of Business World Insights. Uh, we'd like to thank our distinguished speakers for the insights that they shared, which we trust will be useful when we all plan our rebound. Uh, join us a week from now on January 27 at 11 a.m. for the second leg of this series. Have a good day, everyone, and stay safe.